All right, welcome to part one of the multi-trial series uh, where we're going to use the same data from the first series where we looked at single trial at a time. Uh, and we're going to stick completely in MATLAB and we're going to work with all the trials there and we're going to end up uh, looking at how we might monitor performance change over time from the sports science perspective. Um, so we won't use any complex statistical methods. We will use some basic magnitude interpretations. Um, that's kind of where we'll leave it. So if we're looking at the MATLAB window here, all the highlights in here, I have the script open that was created throughout the first five videos of series one working with a single trial. And what we're going to do is use this script and make some modifications to it to allow it to work with all the trials at one time. So the first thing we're going to do is create a little bit of, of sections here because we're going to work in the sections. And so right here at the import trial on line 11, I'm going to go ahead and put another parenthesis because I want to separate this. And I want to work in this first section here where we clear the workspace, sh shut off all the warnings, close all the figures, and where we set the directory. What we're going to do is add a, a couple of um, dialog boxes, well, one at the first bit here. Um, that way we know how many trials we're going to work with. Now, the reason I'm going to do this is because we want to make sure we're organizing the trials and the sessions appropriately. Um, there are certain testing environments, so different teams um, that we may work with where we're collecting more trials every single session for one team than we are for another team. And this is just one way we can make sure that process goes in there without having to necessarily um, change the script, right? When the script runs, we'll tell it how many trials. So what we're going to do here is put a note here and specify the number of trials per session, okay? And so the first line is we're going to create a dialog box that is a prompt for us to enter some text. So I'm going to go ahead and call this a prompt. I'm going to do an equals and a squiggly bracket because we want to type in some words here. Now the words here that I'm typing, those are going to be the text that pops up. So I'm going to say enter the number of trials recorded in each session. Then what I'm going to do is give a title to the dialog box. So I'll call this DLG title, so dialog title. And we're going to call this in single quotes, number of trials. And that's simply going to show up on the dialog box so we know what the, what the entry is meant to have. Because if we're going to have a bunch of dialog boxes pop up here, uh, it's good to know and have a title to say, oh man, what's this dialog box asking? It's really uh, useful when we get to saving later on. I'm also going to put a default input. So this is being called DEF or DEF input. And I'm going to make that five because five is the input or the standard number that I would use in a session. Some argue that three is sufficient. I like to go a little higher. Uh, and so we try to record five at any uh, session. So I'm going to give these uh, some descriptions. So the input value. All right, for the dialog box. Then what I'm going to do is another um, specification here. It's um, specifying the interpreter, and we're going to use a, a TEX interpreter. And we can Google that on MATLAB's documentation if you want to. But all that's doing is making it possible for us to use various uh, character types if we want to put superscripts, color specifiers, any type of spice we want to put in there. Uh, it's providing the option to do that. So we'll go opts.interpreter. And I got this title directly from uh, MATLAB's tutorial documentation, so uh, don't blame me for that. 
And um, all this is doing is specifying TEX as the interpreter. All right, our final bit is going to specify the number of trials. What we're going to do, because in this dialog box, it, we're putting in text data, right? The purple uh, type of input. It's a different type. It's not a what they call um, double or numerical text. What we have to do is convert that to numerical text. And so this is a little bit of a, a unique kind of code. But what we're going to do is say str to num. So that's string to numerical data. We're going to open a parenthesis and go cell to mat. Now that is cell to matrix format. So cell data is a little bit different. You can, you can Google MATLAB cell data versus MAT data. Um, it's just a little specification we have to do to convert the type of information in MATLAB to the one that we're going to need it to be. So what we're going to do is do those conversions on the input dialog. So that's the, um, you know, the, the value that's being input from the prompt with the title of that. We're going to set now some, some appearance characteristics. So in a bracket, I'm going to do a one space 50. Now what that's doing is specifying the size of the input text where we're going to put the number. So if I do trials and put five, there will be a, a certain amount of white space for how that's going to happen. I'm sorry if you hear the banging in the background. They're doing some construction outside the house. Um, so bear with that if you can. Um, okay, so we're specifying the, the size, and then what we're going to do is use the default input and the OPTS cat interpreter that we're using. So we've got a number of parentheses there. We've got to make sure those all close out. And just to give a note, this is convert the entered value from string to numerical data. And that's what that line is doing. And then after this, we're going to create a sessions variable because we need to know how many sessions we have from the number of trials. And so we're going to take the length of my files. So if we remember when we imported, and we'll show what that looks like, there's 15 trials. So that length of those trials will be 15. And we'll divide by trials. And what this is going to do is determine the number of test sessions. All right, so what I can do is run this section. And you'll, if you recall from the single trial series, this will pull up a dialog box for me to locate the files. And then this will be a dialog box to specify the number of trials per session. So if I go up here, because I've set these two uh, specific sections. I can click in this section with yellow and hit run section. Now that's only going to work because this is a saved script that we worked with before. Otherwise you may have to add that to the path. So we'll run the section dialog box to find the files. Okay, and now the dialog box to pop up for the number of trials. Now you notice the size of this box, the white bar, that's what this 1 to 50 is specifying. You'll see the default input is in there as 5. If I wanted to, I could delete that and change it to whatever I wanted. I would say did 10 trials, whatever. But we're going to keep it at 5 because that's what we're working with. We'll hit OK. And all that information will pop in here. So you see some things that look familiar from the previous scripts. If you ran through those, the 15 trials we're working with. Now we've got the number of trials and the number of sessions. Okay. Now the next bit we're going to do is just take all of the scripts. All of this information here is what we ran through in the previous um, stuff. What I'm going to do in the previous videos for the single trial series. What I'm going to do is go ahead and delete this little bit at the end because we're not going to need that, that exporting. But every variable that we wanted to work with, we calculated here the phase times uh, and uh, specific endpoints for where those phases were, identifying takeoff, all that fun stuff. 
So we're gonna now do a lot of playing with this section here um, but to customize it a little bit to make it work for the trials. Now what I'm gonna do here is the first line of this section where we actually have code, we're gonna use what's called a for loop. And we're gonna tell it uh, essentially what a for loop is gonna do is I'm gonna give it a certain number of times I want it to loop through. And which means, so if I look here on my files, I've got 15 trials and previously we ran the code individually here. Oops, don't wanna do that. Ran the code here on this trial had to move the data over, and then we had to rerun the code on this trial. And then on this trial, the loop is just gonna automatically sort of automate that to run through this one, finish, and move right on to this one. We're gonna also have to store variables in an organized fashion so that every variable we calculate will be organized based on the trial number. Okay, so the first line we're gonna hear is initiate that for loop. So a for loop is initiated with the word for and a space. There's another type of loop called a while loop. You don't use those very frequently, but if you wanted to kind of play around with while loops also, you can if you just look up the MATLAB documentation. It's not too different from a for loop. For the for loop here, we're gonna go for. We're gonna use the letter I. Now I is just the, the kind of, it's a counter, but it's just the descriptor for the counter that I was trained on. So you can call this anything you want to. Common ones are, are J. Okay, those of you biomechanical folks, you might know coordinate systems and we'll do things with IJK, um, but you can call them whatever you want to. So I tend to rely on IJ and K just for those reasons. But I'll do for I, so I is my counter, and you'll see where that comes into play here in a minute. Equals one, so it's gonna start at one, and the colon means it will end on the length of my files. Right, so the loop is gonna loop through the first and end through the length of my files. And if you look, it's gonna start at one and at the length of my files, which is 15. Okay. Now, what we're gonna do here is specify this right here where we had the three, and this is because we left off on the third trial from that previous example. But here we can change this to be I. That's gonna be the counter. So the file that we're gonna work with and then do all these other processes too is gonna to be I, which is matching the counter. So remember the first one through the 15th one. So that I is first gonna do the first file, it's gonna run through and then do the second file, all of which that I is updating based on the file that it wants. Okay, important thing here is that the next bits of, of code, those next three lines, full file name, fprintf and num, those don't have to change, okay? How we extract the data in the coordinate systems, that does not have to change. Here I've got my filtering process. Um, I've got it grayed out here because we did not do the filtering. What I'm gonna go ahead and do here though actually is put that filtering back in. So I'll uncomment, you'll see it removes those comments, those percent signs that were there. And I'm gonna change this to 100 Hertz. Um, that way, if we think about the filtering processes we've talked about before and in the paper that I referenced in those uh, series of single trial videos, um, 100 hertz filter is not very aggressive, so it's not going to impact the jumping. But there is some evidence or some papers out there I've seen that are using 100 hertz for landing uh, smoothing processes. So we're going to go ahead and use that 100 hertz so it won't affect jumping, but it will have some smoothing without compromising the landing. Okay, and again, if you don't want to filter, you can leave those commented. That's totally um, your kind of methodological art form. But what I will do is give this a comment and say set filter parameters, so just so we know what that little section is doing. Okay, and then from there, I've got my FZ with the filter added. I don't have anything for FX or FY because we're not going to use them. But if you were going to use the FX and FY, you'd have to repeat this line for those data. Okay, our calculations of body weight and how we calculated all of these start variables, none of this is gonna change. So what I'm actually going to do is just scroll down 
until we get to the variables that we calculated here. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit of a graph here. And I'm going to put some spaces in here so I can work here. And what I'm going to do is simply just create time normalized plots of the jumping phase and the landing phase. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I want to visually inspect those files. So every time I run through them, you think, man, we're working with a lot of files at one time. In this case, 15, as the, you get to more sessions down the road, that could be 100 files. Um, and so we want to be able to run through these commands we've done above and make sure those commands operated correctly and there's not a trial that's been processed poorly and will compromise your data. So I'm going to create these plots and I'm just going to create an FZ plot. Um, well, actually here, let me put my notes. So we'll create some time normalized curves to inspect data quality. All right. And so we'll start with the FZ plot. Now this, you could call it FZ jump. I've just called it FZ plot just because I'm a terrible name uh, person. But we're going to do that, and what we're going to do is open a parenthesis and say all of the rows of column I. Okay, so essentially, if you think about um, if we had the FZ and we opened it up in one of the workspace data, it would have been one column with a bunch of rows. Okay. And so what we're going to do is create a new variable that has a bunch of rows. That's what's specified here with the, the colon. And we're going to comma and use the counter to specify all of the rows of column I. So when it's working with trial 1, this means all of the rows of column 1. When we're working with trial 2, this means all of the rows of trial 2, so on and so forth. So then we'll type our equals. I'm going to use MATLAB's interp1 function. So this is a function that you can you can search. You can also type help interp1 in the command window and MATLAB will give you the information here. Okay, we're simply using uh, an interpolation method here. Okay, we're going to interpolate the data to 101 data points so that we can get time normalized curves because we know the jump times of a given trial are going to vary quite uh, quite sporadically, and that can influence how we can easily inspect the curves. So we're just going to do this here. I'm going to open a parenthesis and type interp. So that's interpolate one, uh, one dimensional. And we're going to interpolate the FZ, so the, the vertical force. But we're going to do it from one. So if you recall from the previous set of videos, one was going to be the first data point of the jump, so the time the counter movement started. And we're going to do that until takeoff. All right. We're going to add a comma. And we're going to say lin space. Now, this is a MATLAB function that creates equally spaced intervals. So that's we're interpolating it from certain time spacings to equally spaced something else's. And we're going to specify the number of those equally spaced parts. So the interpolation kind of parameters there. Okay, so we're going to go one. It will be the length of FZ from one to takeoff. Okay, we'll close the parentheses on those. So essentially, that those lin space, those equally spaced uh, data points, will start at one, go to the end of. Let me, oops, let me go to the end of FZ, but we're going to specify, you know, that interval that we're using. We don't want the whole trial, just one to take off. Now we're going to add a comma and specify the number of elements. I've seen in the literature some people time normalize to 500 data points. This is where you can specialize that. I'm using 101. Reason being I want to time normalize from 0 to 100 percent. Then I'm going to close all these parentheses. Okay, there's three parentheses there. And then what I'm going to do is transpose this we talked about transposing uh, when we calculate time to change it from a row, uh, one row of a bunch of columns to one column of a bunch of rows. And so that's what we're doing here. Okay, and so that's going to create that time normalized plot. And you'll see when we run through the script, we'll end up with 15 FZ plots.
Okay, so it'll have one a time normalized curve for all of the jumps. I'm also going to just copy this line and paste it right below and change this now to FZ land plot. Okay. So I'm going to do this again for the landing, but I'm going to save some time and copy some things and paste. The only thing now I have to change is my gap here, or the interval uh, that I want this to use to normalize. So I'm going to change this because this is landing. And I want to go from ground contact till the landing end, right? The end of downward motion. And then so what I can do is just copy that and replace this here with that line, okay? And so we can give these uh, some comments at the end, jumping, landing. Okay, so then we've created those there. Now for our variable extraction, we don't have to do really any major change. The only thing we have to do is add that we want the loop to adhere to these data. So if I wanted to end up having a jump height for every trial, I'm going to go ahead and paste or type in this parenthesis colon comma I end parenthesis. So when I paste that there now, right, we're going to have a jump height. That's all the rows. Now so there's only going to be one row of jump height, so you could technically make this a one. But I just default to all of the rows and MATLAB will figure out that there's only one row. And I meaning the number of the trial that we're working with. So I'm just going to go ahead and paste that on each of my variables. And uh, I remember if you were watching the previous videos, we talked about getting instantaneous rate of force development and then like a, a peak value or a local maximum. I'm not using that, so it's going to remain commented. Okay, we'll continue on with adding in our counters. Again, all of the jumping and landing performance variables and strategy variables, so, so there's a lot. Now you don't have to work with all of these, but it's good to have them all there in case you wanted to. Okay, so we've got that done. Now the last bit is to put an end at the uh, end of this, right? Because we have a loop that started up here, but we need to tell it when that loop should end. And so at the end of this line is where I'm going to type end. And you'll see that's going to put this connection all the way up here with line 19 where I put the 4. Okay, so that line, you'll see that vertical line is going up here, and there's a loop here. Okay, what I'll do here now is I'll do an enter and I'll create a new section because that's where we're going to do and pick up in the next video with some, some really spicy, well, actually we'll, we'll put the, the curve inspection in this video. So we'll get a little, few, little bit of more time. But what I'll do now is run this section. So since, if you remember, I created sections, I ran this section to open the directory and specify the number of trials. Now, if I just click in this section that we fixed, I can come up here and hit run section. And it will run through all of those trials. Now, this is the first time I've run MATLAB today, so it runs a little slow. But you can see that note that we put right here in that fprintf, now reading in the file, it's showing you all the files that it ran through in red. So it operated all those files. Now, if we wanted to see if our variable calculations, for instance, jump height, let's look at that one. How does the output look there? You'll see it's a 1 by 15, so 1 row by 15 columns. And there's the jump heights for every trial. Okay, again, we haven't organized them into sessions yet, so this is all 15 trials. We know there's three trials per session, but if I barred those, just real quick, you can see how those jump heights my MATLAB's running a little slow, sorry. You see how all those jump heights have changed over the, the various sessions. And that will be the same for any variable. So if we look at, um, like here, some of these jump time, right? So we'll still have all those variables there. So the last thing we're going to do for, for this 
is create now a new section and this is going to be a point where the user will select to continue or halt the program uh, based on inspecting force curves. Okay, because if you run through this and you end up finding that one trial is bad, you don't want to continue on with that script and have it run through everything else. You just want it to stop right then and there. And you can go back into the earlier part of the script and kind of diagnose a problem if there is one. So what uh, we're going to do here is I'm going to do a CLC because if you remember in the command window, it tells you all the trials it ran through. And that's all nice because uh, if one trial doesn't run through, it'll halt and give you an error and you know what trial it last finished on, meaning the next trial is where the error went. But we don't need anything in the command window anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the command window. Now what I'm going to do is plot the FZ curves from all trials. Right, I'm going to create a figure. What I'm going to do now is specify some characteristics of that figure. Uh, some things we haven't or did not do in the previous videos. At least I don't recall these being involved. But what we're going to do is in single quotes, we're going to type a bunch of words out here. And what we're going to do is the first one, we're going to type window state. And that or in that single quote, and then comma and open a new single quote and say maximized. Okay, what that's going to do is tell MATLAB that we want the uh, figure window to be maximized. Okay, um, so I put my end quote here. Okay, and then we're going to name it. So I'm going to put name, comma, single quote, and what the name of that figure is going to be. And I'm going to call it force curves for inspection because when the figure pops up and you know maybe you haven't looked at the script for a while, you want to know what what is this figure for, and it'll have a title on it. It says force curves for inspection. We're going to take number title, because normally these are named in numbers, you know, figure one, figure two, figure three, and we're going to turn that off. Okay, so all just one line here to make the figure big, right? Because if I were to just, and in the command window, just type figure, right, it pops up that small figure, the figure size that we were working with previously. But here, with this line of command, with the window state maximized in the name, See, the, it'll default to the maximum size of your screen, and up here in the top left, it has force curves for inspection, so it has a title. All right, now let's specify we want the jumping curve, and what we're going to do is get pretty spicy with this figure and uh, do a subplot. Now, <clears throat> I think we talked about subplots previously, but if not, essentially what we're going to do is put two figures side by side. So when I type subplot, and in parentheses, I do one, two, one, I'm saying we're going to create a subplot, so there's going to be multiple plots on this figure. There's going to be one row of figures, there's going to be two columns of figures, and this is the first figure, and it starts from left and goes to right. Okay, then what I'm going to do is go H1, I'm going to name this plot because I'm going to end up putting a legend on it. And we're going to say plot, and I'm going to set the time interval here because there's no normally when we plot we put time, but we're not going to use that because this is time normalized figure. So I'm going to go 0 to 100 and set the time up to be that normalized interval. And then I'm going to go FZ plot. Okay. I'm going to then go with a legend. And in parentheses here, I'm going to put H1 because I want that legend to apply to H1 with a comma. I'm going to specify certain things here. And, uh, well, actually, let's uh, let's hold off on that. Let's just run the, do I have a figure open? No. So we'll just run these. I'll just copy these, paste them into the command window, and hit enter. So there's the first subplot of the time normalized data points, right? We'll talk about once we put the landing one next to it, we'll talk about why we want to look at this. Okay, so I'll minimize this. 
But the reason that the legend and why I held off on putting that is because we're going to put it in a certain location so that when it pops up, it's not going to automatically be in the way of the curve. So when I get here to legend, I'm going to specify location in single quotes with a comma, and I'm going to say south. So I want it at the south end of the figure. Because I'm working with a bunch of trials, I'm going to make the orientation horizontal because normally it's vertical. And so that will take up more space. And so I'm going to type in here orientation. I'm going to change that to horizontal. Then what I'm going to do is change the number of columns. That's num columns. And I'm going to do the number of columns according to my number of trials. So that's a variable we've already got, so no single quotes on the trials. And we'll end that there. No single quotes on trials. So now if I copy that legend text, paste it in the command line. Oops, I typed legend wrong. I spelled it wrong here, right? You see that? So MATLAB corrected me. So I'll do yes. Let me fix that right here. And then bring back up that figure window. You'll see it pop my legend in down at the bottom. So this will be pretty good for, you know, most jump trials having anywhere from three to five sessions. It won't kind of overlap the figure. Now you can also, I'll let you task yourself with looking at how to put the legend outside the figure window. Um, essentially you would type south outside where we have south, but, um, you know, you can change it to northwest and put it up here. Right, south, what, southeast and put it down here, whatever you want to do, right? But we're just doing south. And you can see it's organized in these uh, rows. So there's three rows of five columns. And the reason I've done that is because the first row is session one, second row, session two, right? So it's, it's sort of organized. So the next thing we want to do is put these labels on here for time and the Y axis. So let's just real quickly do that. We'll do the X label, that is jump time. And remember this is normalized, so it's zero to 100%. Okay. And I'm running through these labeling because we've done labeling in the previous videos. So if you're unfamiliar with that, go check out the series number one videos because uh, we do a lot of plotting in there. We'll add the Y label. Since this is a force curve, we know that this is force in the standard unit of Newtons. We did not normalize anything there. So let's just go ahead and run those two lines. Bring up our figure and there, pop in our axes, okay? Next that we're gonna do is landing. Okay, so now we're gonna specify the new subplot location. We're going to do one row, two columns. And now it's figure two, or graph two. And we're going to call this H1 also. You can call it H2, but it's just going to override the original H1. We don't need to store those. Uh, so I'm just going to call it H1 and just try to reduce the number of variables in the workspace. So now we're going to repeat this process. Everything is going to stay the same. So actually what I could do is copy this, paste it here, and change this line here, 157, and add land, so we know that we're now plotting the FZ land plot. We're going to now change the X label from jump time to landing time, and the label is going to stay the same. So what I'll do here is just copy that and paste it in the command window and run. Go back to my figure. And you'll see there's the second graph of the landing. Okay, now the reason we wanted to plot these was because we're using some pretty uh, detailed ways to, uh, if you recall from the first series of videos, identify that takeoff and ground contact events. So I want to make sure, especially that down here at ground or takeoff, there's not a, a takeoff event and then a flat line for any one of these trials, meaning that it identified takeoff poorly. At the start of the jump, I want to make sure there's no kind of flat squigglies and then a reduction in force or an increase in force so that we can know whether or not our uh, start threshold 
was appropriate for these trials. Here you can see that it was, there's none of those flat lines and then a decrease, right? There's no uh, increase and then a bunch of flat squigglies and then it goes down into the jump, right? So essentially the trial before the counter movement started were, were pretty good. Um, and that's nice because you don't have to do anything fancy. Something cool that you can just look at here is since we looked at, we searched for preloading, you can see there's kind of a preloading trial. And again, this is covered in the previous videos for single trial series, but these represent an initial slight increase in force before the reduction or the unload. These trials here was where there was no increase in force and it went straight to a reduction. So you might be able to see that depending on what trial this corresponds to and what session, there's a unique kind of start initiation strategy happening. And um, those are some cool things you can notice on this graph. Here for landing, right, we, we don't want to see a long period of time here before there's a big rise in force. Um, this here is just slightly because the threshold that we're using, because it's so precise, is much smaller than perhaps we might normally use. Some studies use standard 20 Newton thresholds, things we've talked about before. But over here, you know, this threshold, I can't remember what it was. I think it was like eight or nine Newtons or something like that. Um, so it's it's pretty small and then it rises up those of you unfamiliar with landing when you hear peak impact force uh, I encourage you all if you're gonna use that variable is to know which one you're talking about for us we're talking about this one the second peak some of the older classic literature calls that f2 this peak down here that most of the trials have is called f1 and that is the forefoot impact and then the rear foot midfoot kind of impact here Okay, so this is the landing period, and we can, ex uh, we can just inspect that right there, okay? And so what I'm going to do is just close this graph out. Now what we want to do is create a uh, user selection to, to determine whether or not you want to keep running the code. So we're going to ask a question in a dialog box. So we're going to ask to... Save the output, um, essentially to, you know, keep the script running. So, so we're going to put that in there or halt. So we're going to ask for an answer. I'm calling this answer. Again, you can name your variables whatever you want to. So you can call this one Joe. I use an answer. We're going to do a quest dialog. So quest DLG. So question dialog. Open a parenthesis, and I'm going to specify and say, would you like to continue the program based on force curves? I'm going to add a question mark. I'm going to end that with a single quote. And I'm going to put a, a comma and three little dots here. That Those three little dots just simply mean... Uh, we're going to continue on the next line. Okay, so I could keep typing this and have it go off the screen. I have to scroll over, or I can just do those three dots, hit enter, and the script will continue down here at the bottom. Okay, and essentially it will continue right here after this comma. So I'm going to open another single quote and put save options. End my single quote, put a comma. Now you don't necessarily need to put the three dots here. I typically do because I'm organizing the responses. So I'm gonna put yes, then I'm going to put no, and then I'm gonna put another no. Now this is something I haven't looked into as to why I have to put a third no. Maybe somebody can comment on why you do that. It's just something I had to figure out when I was originally writing these was that it required that and I didn't Laziness kicked in and I didn't want to go figure out why because it works uh, So not necessarily the best practice, but you know It is what it is So this is gonna pop up a dialog box Okay, and we'll, we'll run this when we get there But the next line we're gonna do is to handle the response that I enter so what we're gonna do is switch the answer from uh, the string text in the the pink kind of purpley writing to numerical data. So I'm going to go switch, space, answer. 
Okay, the case here, what we're gonna work with is going to be yes. So if it's a yes, I'm gonna hit enter, and we're gonna create a variable called save selection. So that's essentially the to choice of whether or not you want it to save it equals one. So we're gonna assign this value to a yes selection. The other case we're gonna work with will be no. In this case, what we're gonna do is save the selection as zero. All right, so we're gonna assign value if no selection. We're gonna end that switch. Okay, so just like a loop, when we open the switch, we have to tell it when to end. Okay, and now based on uh, those answers, we're going to determine to stop the script. Okay, so what we're going to do is an if statement. So we used the if statement before when we were identifying start of the counter movement in the single trial series. So we're going to go with the if, and we're going to say if the save selection is equal to zero. And again, we've used the if statements before, so we know that there's two equal signs here. We're going to then hit enter and type return. Return, this is going to cancel the script if no is selected by the user. And then we're going to type end. Okay, and then what we're going to do here is close all. And this is going to close the figure after we inspect it. So if I were to run this section, our figures will pop back up, and on top of the figures will be the answer dialog box. Okay, and then we'll make our selection here. So if I run the section, it creates the figures and then pops in that dialog box asking me if I wanna do this. Now, you know, you can move this around if I wanted to move it and really give an inspection. Okay, and then I can just hit yes or no Either way, no matter which one I select, it's going to clear out the figure afterwards. So this is not a figure we're going to save. Okay, so I'm just going to hit no because there's no other script afterward. Okay, and figure should close. Why is my figure not closing? It should close. Let me do this again when I hit yes. It closes when I hit yes, but not when I hit no. Interesting. That's something we can diagnose at a later date just for the for the interest of time. Um, but that there is the first step to working with multiple trials. Just to recap, we've retained 99% of the script we wrote before. We just now specified that we want it to go through a loop. We've added the end at the bottom and the four with the counter at the top to run through the loop, and then we've specified in here that we're gonna use that counter rather than specify the number of trials. Right, so in the next video that we'll do, we will uh, start working with um, determining whether or not you want to save the data or not and store it in a team folder or an individual person athlete, if you want, folder and then create the actual figures that we'll use to track over time and inspect change.